think this is going to be the last video in this series, at least for a while. Uh, I'm going to talk very, very briefly about residues and a tiny bit of residue calculus, um, and also about Laurent series. Uh, I want to go back to a perspective that I, I've mentioned a little bit, but I haven't really focused on, and that's um, power series. Remember that um, because all the powers of Z were differentiable, then it's not too hard to believe that any power series is going to be di differentiable, as long as it's in Z and doesn't have Z bars, for example. Okay, um, And so this is going to be differentiable. And so, for example, the closed curve contour integral, if this is closed, not just any curve, is going to be 0. Okay, Let me try the focus again. I'm not sure if it really picked up the focus last time. Um, and even more than that, we actually did some examples where even though um, negative powers have singularities at the origin, as long as you just don't go right through the singularity, then the integral of those guys was also 0 as long as k was not equal to 1. Okay, And of course, the big exception was that the integral of any closed curve encircling the origin of z to the minus 1 was 2 pi i. Okay, It's kind of a joke in complex analysis classes is that if you either guess either 0 or 2 pi i to all the problems, you're going to get a, f a fairly substantial uh, percentage of them right. So um, what does that mean? It says that even if I have negative powers here, I'm going to get something that's pretty well behaved and where I know a lot about their integrals. So that's called a Laurent series. That's where f of z is given by a power series, but I allow a finite number of negative terms. Turns out to get pretty dicey if you try to go infinite in both directions. Um, not there's definitely places where that works, but I don't want to don't want to run worry about it. Okay, then what we can say is that the integral of any such function that's getting fairly general. Okay. Um, it allows us to have some mild singularities, um, what are called uh, poles, at the uh, at the origin, and then have all the things we can do with power series as well. This is just going to be everything's going to drop out except for whatever that minus one coefficient uh, power times two pi i. Okay, so this coefficient here, if you can express a function in this way then uh, this coefficient is called the residue. Specifically, I'm allowing the singularity only at the origin. We could definitely translate. We could take like powers of z minus z naught or something like that um, and have a singularity elsewhere. But let's just be simple for right now. That's the residue. It would be the residue at the origin of this function. And that is a super important thing to know about a function. And in particular, it has something to do with um, the singularities of that function. There's going to be 0 if the function doesn't actually blow up at all there. Um, but it's interesting that it only talks about how it blows up in the z to the minus 1. A bigger blow up, sort of what you'd think is maybe more important, z to the minus 2 or z to the minus 3, something that blows up more strongly in terms of the, the magnitude, actually doesn't contribute when you're looking at these closed curve integrals. Okay. So it turns out there's a whole subject called residue calculus here. Um, it's a tremendous subject. I just want to show you one very uh, famous example of that. Okay, um, I want to integrate ordinary real improper integral, 1 over 1 plus x squared. Now, we happen to know that's arctangent, but suppose we didn't know that. Okay, And there's a lot of somewhat just a little bit more complicated integrals where this technique I'm going to show you is definitely the best way to do it. I just wanted to start with one that was really simple. So I'm going to pick one that we actually happen to know how to do. OK, I'm going to say that's the integral over a certain curve in the complex plane of dz over 1 plus z squared, where that curve is just the real axis, just going all the way from here to here. OK, how does that help us? OK, well. I claim what I can do is I can think of this as a curve that sort of goes all all the, the real axis and then makes a huge loop. You probably can't see that whole loop. Yeah. It makes a huge loop 
up into the complex plane. To be really precise, of course, this is really a limit of a finite integral from like minus b to b. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn that into a closed loop by putting, putting a semicircle up here. Then I'm going to let the limit, uh, I'm going to take the limit as b goes to infinity. That means this part becomes exactly this improper integral. And then it's not hard to show that this part actually just gets smaller and smaller and vanishes in the limit. Why is that? It's because the length here is proportional to b, and the magnitude of the function is roughly proportional to 1 over b squared. And so it dies. Okay, so this is the limit as b goes to infinity of the integral over, let's call it semi sub b, the semicircle of radius b, the upper semicircle, of dz over 1 plus z squared. That's a closed curve. And so its integral is just going to be um, done by residue calculus. Um, if, now, now I have to go to, to the case where the residues can be calculated at some other points, but it's not that hard. And in fact, what you can show is that if I've got some finite number of points where it blows up and where I could have a non-zero residue, it's just going to be 2 pi i times the sum of the residues at those points. Now, where does this guy blow up? In the upper half plane. Notice, as this curve gets bigger and bigger and bigger, I'm going to get any kind of uh, residue, any kind of singularity that's in the up upper half plane. But, um, well, so I can take out the limit. So again, I'm doing the super, super lightning introduction. It's the sum of the residues of this complex function, okay? And this is all over all singularities, okay? Well, what is this function? Just a little algebra. This is 1 over z plus i z minus i. This is where the complex numbers are really useful. We couldn't factor this if we only knew about real numbers. And doing a tiny little bit of partial fractions, this is, uh, let's see, it's minus than plus, I think, right? Yeah. If I put this over a common denominator, I'm going to get z plus i and a z minus i. They'll can the z's will cancel. I'll get a 2i, and I cancel. You can check that algebra if you want. Okay. Well, this guy is only singular at mi z equals minus i. Okay, that doesn't matter because that's not in the contour that I chose. Notice that the contour I chose does go counterclockwise, which is the right direction for, for this, uh, this theorem. Okay. And this is the only thing that's going to contribute. I've got a, uh, a 1 over z minus i, and that singularity is right, right here at z equals i. Uh, it's just a shift of the standard one, just 1 over z, and we know the residue for that is just 1. Okay, and so this is just um, 2 pi i um, times 1 over 2 i, that's this guy, okay, times the residue of 1 over z minus i, which is 1. And the 2's cancel, and I get pi, which is the answer that you get if you do it the arctangent way as well. This is really cool. It's sort of a really alternate explanation of why this weird pi comes in. It's a very strange answer. We just have pure algebra. Where does the pi come in as the answer to this? It's not something you would guess. Well, it says the algebra, you really do do it algebraically up to this point. You, this is just pure algebra. There's no pi's or anything right here. Then you isolate this part, and you realize that it's Cauchy's theorem, the, uh, the residue theorem, that's telling us when we go around a circle with this special kind of gadget, a translate of 1 over z, we get that magic 2 pi i coming in. Then a little bit of algebra reduces it down to a pi. It's a beautiful result, and um, I know I did a very, very quick presentation of it, but it's the start of a wonderful story.